In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Grace to you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul teaches us a glorious divine truth. That there is no more sacrifice for sins. For where there is forgiveness of these, he writes, there is no longer any offering for sin. And this truth is far more significant than it may at first appear. For as we noted last Lord's Day, the single largest Christian denomination in the world teaches that there needs to be a continuous sacrifice and offering for sin. Or as they may try to say, a ceaseless representation to God of the one sacrifice in order to freshly propitiate God. Apparently, God needs to be re-propitiated, which means His wrath needs to be turned away again and again. Because what Christ suffered on the cross didn't quite do it. That the one sacrifice of Christ was not for all time, as they say, but needs to be represented at all times. But the reality is that, as Paul writes, Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. And that by a single offering, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Notice that the Apostle says that Christ, by a single offering by a single sacrifice, has atoned for all sin and has perfected, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. It is done. It is finished. The question of your sin is forever settled. And so we who are being sanctified In the church, Christ has already placed within the sphere of His perfection. The phrase is significant for all time. That phrase. In the Greek, it means continuously, continually, unendingly, forever, perpetually, permanently. It means Christ's single sacrifice and offering of Himself 2,000 years ago for the forgiveness of sin is perpetually in effect. Is permanently effective and continually effectual for those who endure in faith until the end. The Lord declares, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. And it's important to pause here to reflect on just what God will no longer remember. Which is to say, our sins and lawless deeds. Because sin doesn't just mean external wrongdoing. Sin doesn't even only refer to internal wrongdoing. Sin at its depth refers to the willing separation from God. That is the essence of what sin truly is. Our inborn, the technical term is concupiscence, which is to say our inborn inclination towards selfish desire. For example, To take an analogy, we could take a klutz or a messy person and put them in a room where they have yet to act klutzy, where they have yet to make a mess. They haven't done anything outwardly or even inwardly to create a mess. 
But the second we start setting them in motion, the moment we invite the klutz to come up and help us set the table, what will the klutz do? They'll spill the cup. They'll spill the glass. They'll tip over the plate. They'll knock over the chair. They'll trip on the stool. Because being a klutz is prior to any, prior to any action of klutziness. Making the mess for a messy person happens prior to them making an actual mess. Put them in a neat and clean room, and what will happen? After five minutes, maybe there's no mess. After 50 minutes, after five days, after five weeks, the room will be a mess. Because it's their status, it's their state of being as a mess maker, as a messy person that creates the mess. And so even though we may not be sinning at any given moment in thought or word or deed, being in the position, having the status or or being a sinner means that we are yet a sinner. And so that is the real uh, thing that is important for us to be able to understand about this separation from God because it is our status as a sinner, as separated from God, that is the essence of what sin even is. And it's important to stress this point because many have the mistaken idea that sin only means inner or outer actions, whether they're thoughts or words or deeds, and that it is only on that level that we do wrong. But in reality, all sinful thoughts and words and deeds are fundamentally the activity of the more fundamental separation and turning away from God. God who is life. God who is life, light, love, truth, goodness. The purpose of the divine law then, acting as a mirror to expose our sins to ourselves, is not merely to show us that we are guilty of lawless thoughts or lawless words or lawless deeds, but to reveal to us how we are fundamentally separated willingly from God. How we are fundamentally willingly separated from divine life and light and love and truth and goodness. But Christ, but Christ has reunited what was separated. He has reunited in His own person human nature and divine nature so that where there was separation in Christ, there is union. And so Christ's singular sacrifice for sin means God no longer remembers your sins or your lawless deeds. And He counts you righteous. Because where there is forgiveness of these, Paul writes, there is no longer any offering for sin. We don't make another offering for sin. We don't week by week make another offering for sin. Because Christ made one single offering for sin that is good perpetually. The price has already been paid. The one offering has already been made. And we ever stand upon the assurance that flows from that one offering. Therefore, as Paul writes, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. And so we don't continuously make an offering of Christ for sins. And we don't continually propitiate God. For in Christ... The divine wrath has been averted from those who trust in Him, in His word of promise. He offered Himself once and for all. And so now instead of continuously offering a sacrifice for sin, we instead continuously receive from the divine abundance of His one sacrifice, which is to say His body and blood including the singular and comprehensive effects of the one and only sacrifice 
He made 2,000 years ago. It's this boundless confidence in our divine pardon that moves us and enables us to walk freely in Christ. This is why, as the Apostle Paul can write, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us. Through the curtain, he writes, that is, he interprets, through his flesh. And why his flesh? Simply, his flesh is eternally alive and united to the divine nature in the divine person of the Son of God. His flesh forms the living way. His living flesh being the point of access the contact point between man and God. And so as we receive His body and blood in Holy Communion, we continuously live in the constant stream of forgiveness, the river of forgiveness flowing from Christ to us, a river of living waters that even wells up within us and flows out of our hearts as Christ says in the Gospel of John. And so we are called to holy confidence. And what is our confidence? The blood of Jesus. The blood of the New Testament. In His blood is our confidence. And this is a profound source of security and true freedom. Because it means something peculiar. Our confidence being in Christ means that our confidence is not in many things, but in one. Our confidence is therefore not in our mood. Our confidence is not in our feelings. Our confidence is not in our emotions. Our confidence is not in our willpower. Our confidence is not in our imperfect works. Our confidence is not in our imperfect repentance or in our imperfect character or anything about us. Our confidence looks away from self. And so as we consider, as Paul writes, how to stir up one another to love and good works, our confidence then is not yet in these works, is not in any way in these works. Our confidence is not even in our act of believing, but in our Savior. Our confidence is not in our act of faith, but in faith's object, Christ. From this confidence emerges all of our good works, all of our labors for the sake of virtue. God putting His law on our hearts and writing them on our minds. But this also means that our sins and our imperfect works cannot act as an impediment or obstacle to confidence. Because our confidence is Christ. Many people discourage themselves because they say, oh, I'm such a sinner. How could God save me? Or forgive me. It is precisely this confession that you are a sinner that makes you eligible for Christ and His sacrifice or His forgiveness. It's the trust alone in what He did, not in how you failed. And it is in Christ who is Himself our righteousness that we trust. Christ who gave Himself for us on the cross, and gives Himself to us in Holy Communion, which is the true thanksgiving. And this faith, this Christ, is the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, which is forever united to the divinity. This means we can, as Paul writes, draw near. Draw near to God in Christ. With a true heart, in full assurance of faith, because our hearts have been sprinkled clean 
from an evil conscience by the blood of the Lamb, and our bodies washed with the pure water of the baptismal Word. Now all of your sins are taken away in Christ. Now all of your sins are taken away in Christ and for the sake of Christ. This is the divine promise to you. Therefore, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.